sisters and brothers, we gather in this sacred night. A night unlike any other night. A night when 2,000 years ago, the light of the world entered the world, but the world rejected him. We venerate this night that we may remember for future generations the great sacrifice that was made for us and the love with which that sacrifice was made. And let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, the light of the world. We ask you to help us not to walk in darkness, but to follow your light and to light the nation before us. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. From the Catechesis by St. John Christosom, Bishop. If we wish to understand the power of Christ's blood, we should go back to the ancient account of its prefiguration in Egypt. Sacrifice a lamb without blemish, commanded Moses, and sprinkle its blood on your doors. If we were to ask him what he meant and how the blood of an irrational beast could possibly save men endowed with reason, his answer would be that the saving power lies not in the blood itself, but in the fact that it is a sign of the Lord's blood. In those days, when the destroying angel saw the blood on the doors, he did not dare to enter. So how much less will the devil approach now when he sees not that figurative blood on the doors, 
but the true blood on the lips of believers, the doors of the temple of Christ. If you desire further proof of the power of this blood, remember where it came from, how it ran down from the cross, flowing from the master's side. The gospel records that when Christ was dead, but still hung on the cross, a soldier came and pierced his side with a lance. And immediately there poured out water and blood. Now the water is the symbol of baptism and the blood of the Holy Eucharist. The soldier pierced the Lord's side. He breached the wall of the sacred temple and I have found the treasure and made it my own. So also with the lamb, the Jews sacrificed the victim and I have been saved by it. There flowed from his side water and blood. Beloved, do not pass over this mystery without thought. It has yet another hidden meaning which I shall explain to you. I said that the water and blood symbolized baptism and the Holy Eucharist. From these two sacraments, the church is born. From baptism, the cleansing water that gives rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit, and from the Holy Eucharist. Since the symbols of baptism and the Eucharist flowed from his side, it was from his side that Christ fashioned the church. Just as he had fashioned Eve from the side of Adam. Moses gives a hint of this when he tells the story of the first man and makes him exclaim, bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. As God then took a rib from Adam's side to fashion a woman, so Christ has given us blood and water from his side to fashion the church. God took the rib when Adam was in a deep sleep. And in the same way, Christ gave us the blood and the water after his own death. Do you understand then how Christ has united his bride to himself and what food he gives us all to eat? By one and the same food, we are both brought into being and nourished as a woman nourishes her child with her own blood and milk. So does Christ unceasingly nourish with his own blood those to whom he himself has given life.
this very special night, we venerate the cross. It's the one time in the liturgical year when we genuflect to something besides Jesus. We genuflect to the cross on this day when the Eucharist is not here present with us. It's a sign that it is our instrument of salvation.
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You are far from my plea and the cry of my distress. My God, I call by day and you give no reply. I call by night and I find no peace. Yet you, O oh God, are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you set them free. When they cried to you, they escaped. In you, they trusted, and never in vain. But I am a worm, and no man scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me deride me. They curl their lips, they toss their heads. He trusted in the Lord, let him save him. Let him release him if this is his friend. Yes, it was you who took me from the womb and trusted me to my mother's breast. To you, I was committed from my birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not leave me alone in my distress. Come close. There is none else to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Fierce bulls of fashion close me in. Against me, they open wide their jaws like lions rending and roaring. Like water, I am poured out. Disjointed are all my bones. My heart has become like wax. It is melted within my breast. Parched as burnt clay is my throat. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Many dogs have surrounded me. A band of the wicked beset me. They tear holes in my hands and my feet and lay me in the dust of death. I can count every one of my bones. These people stare at me and gloat. They divide my clothing among them. They cast lots for my robe. O oh Lord, do not leave me alone. My strength, make haste to help me. Rescue my soul from the sword, my life from the grip of these dogs. Save my life from the jaws of these lions, my poor soul from the horns of these oxen. I will tell of your name to my brethren and praise you where they are assembled. from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. As they led Jesus away, they took hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian who was coming in from the country. And after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, 
the wounds it never bore, and the breast it never nursed. At that time, people will say to the mountains, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if these things are done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now two others, both criminals, were led away with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They divided his garments by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at him and said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him as they approached to offer him wine. They called out, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuked him and said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly, for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus We gather this evening on this most solemn of days. There's great sadness because we know that today we celebrated or re remembered the great sacrifice on the cross. You see, it had to be done. None of us are perfect, and no matter how good we are, we all sin in some small way. We can never make up for all the little things we've done. How many times have we sinned against our own families, being impatient, overlooking them, not giving them credit where credit's due, or just being self-absorbed. But into the world came the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. This is in a stark contrast as we start to turn the lights down and extinguish the candles. And at the end, the one candle that will remain burning is the Easter candle. Candles and light have such a great symbolism in our church. It's a symbolism we barely ever get a chance to break open. You think about the fact that, the, that a, a pillar of cloud of fire led the people in the wilderness when Moses brought them out of the land of slavery in Egypt. It led them to the promised land. It was a light that they followed. Even when we celebrate a baptism, one of my favorite parts is the part where we take a little candle and light it off of the Easter candle and hand it to the parents or godparents and say, receive the light of Christ. Parents and godparents, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. This child of yours has been enlightened by Christ, and he or she is to walk always as a child of the light. May they keep the flame of faith alive in their little heart. And when the Lord comes for them one day, may they go out to meet him with all the saints in the heavenly kingdom. 
I'm sure some of you have had heard stories of people that have had near-death experiences and they they see this long dark tunnel and at the end of the tunnel is this incredibly bright light a light that's so bright that it's it's like looking into the sun but it doesn't hurt your eyes and they're drawn to that light the idea is that when a little baby is baptized into the christian faith a little flame is lit in their heart in their soul and our job as parents and godparents and fellow catholics is to nurture that flame to let that flame grow stronger and stronger at least until they're old enough to keep the flame going on their own then their job is not just to keep the flame going but to light other candles along the way by the way they live their lives the hope being that one day when they stand in that tunnel and they see that bright light at the end the light of christ himself he'll look back and see his own light reflected not only in their soul but in the lives they live this candle holds such promise that this is not the end of the story that after good friday there will always be an easter sunday we are an easter people but it's so important that we don't neglect to look at the suffering that we caused Christ, that we continue to cause him to suffer by our actions. But we're called not to be people of darkness, but people of light. How do we do that? Sometimes it's simple. It's something as simple as being a godparent and making sure that you take the time not just to, to go to the, the christening party after the little baby is baptized and looks so cute in their little new outfit. But it's to take the time to get to know that child, to ask them when they go to CCD class or they ask them when they go to, to mass, what did you hear today? What did you learn? Wow, I remember when I was in CCD. I remember my teacher taught me this or taught me that. Did you hear the story about Noah and the ark? It's those littlest things that we do that make all the difference in the world. And it's how we approach the world. Whether we approach it from the standpoint of the way the most of the public approaches it, or what's in it for me, or whether we approach it in humility, recognizing how God has blessed us. When I was at St. Benedict the Moor in the Hill District, one of my favorite people was a, a woman they called Miss Priscilla. She was about this tall. She had blonde dreadlocks down below her waist. When you would ask, she was from Kentucky, when you would ask Miss Priscilla, how are you doing, Miss Priscilla? She wouldn't say, fine, thank you, how are you? You'd ask her and she would say, I am blessed and highly favored. And you just had the smile. One day I hadn't seen her for two or three weeks and I said, Miss Priscilla, where have you been? She said, oh, I went down to Kentucky to visit my daddy. And she said he was really sick. I said, is he okay? And she said, no, he died. I said, I'm so sorry. How are you doing? She said, kind of sad. And then she looked up with a sly smile and she said, but still blessed. It's those times when we go the extra mile to recognize Christ at work in our life. And it can be in the most mundane of things, the way that we use our gifts to light the way of others to bring light and life into their lives. I have a friend who's, whose dad worked in a glass factory. And what he did was he made those little glass globes that are on the airport along the runways. Often they're either white or they're, they're a bright blue. And I never realized it, but when he told me, he said there's so much math goes into designing them so that they're just the right angle when these giant airplanes carrying hundreds of people are circling the airport in the fog, that if they're at the right angle, they can see that, and those lights will lead them home safely. Who knows how many thousands of lives he protected by just doing his job the way God taught him to use the gifts that he'd been given. Each and every one of us has gifts that we're called to share. Each and every one of us are called to be a light unto the nations. 
It may be something as profound as teaching a Bible study, or it might be something as simple as seeing someone in the supermarket and saying, how are you? And when they say anything other than, oh, I'm doing really great, to inquire further and to tell them that you'll pray for them. Even if it's somebody on the phone, when you call a customer service line and you waited for 15 minutes until you finally got the person and you can tell by the tone of their voice that they've had a rough day. And to say to them, I, you must be having a really busy day when they say, oh yeah, you know what? Before I go to bed tonight, I'll say a prayer for you. Do you have any idea what an impact that makes on people? We're truly called to be a light to the world to recognize that in the lighting of another candle, it never diminishes the glow of our own candle. As a matter of fact, when we do it in faith, we stoke the fires of faith in someone else by sharing our stories of faith. It helps their faith to grow, and the world becomes just a little bit brighter place.